Hello and welcome to the latest Flight Dojo video. I am Blondie, as you, some of you may know me. And today's video I wanted to cover the vast topic of the art of aerial defense. Now before we move any further, let's, let's talk about what we mean by aerial defense. I mean guns on guns, predominantly for this video. So we're not going to be discussing missile employment, either with BVR missiles or AIM-9s or that sort of thing. We're just mainly going to be talking about a gun on gun discussion. So the reason that I think that the art of aerial defense is such an important topic is that it really makes the largest difference, in my opinion, in your online performance. Your kill-death ratio, I would say, is most closely related to your ability to defend yourself in any given situation. In any given battlefield picture, the, your defensive capabilities make the biggest difference. The reason that I say that is because most people can become reasonably confident in the ability to bounce a target, and the ability to assail a target that is naturally already in a disadvantaged state. You come in with more altitude, more speed, more energy, and you are able to capitalize on that situation to get a gun solution. That's pr easy for most people. What's difficult is to be bounced, or to be in a defensive situation, and then to reverse those roles and transition into an offensive engagement. So in an effort to do this topic justice, we're going to use some sources to provide us with the strategies that real tried and true pilots have used in aerial defense. Those sources are going to be, unsurprisingly, Fighter Combat Tactics and Maneuvering by Robert Shaw, as well as the Aerial Attack Study by John Boyd, and the Flight Training Instruction Basic Flight Maneuvering for the T-45 Strike Program, which is the contemporary program used by fighter pilots going through Navy flight training today. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these and we're going to kind of synthesize, hopefully, an all-encompassing strategy that we can use in a gun-on-gun -gun engagement to improve our kill-death ratio and learn to live to fight another day. So first, before we talk about any actual maneuvering of the aircraft, we need to talk about a subject that's even more important. Before we can talk about advanced combat maneuvers, high aspect BFN, any of those strategies, we need to talk about the number one strategy that you can use to make it so those are completely irrelevant. Unsurprisingly, that strategy that's better than BFM is situational awareness. If you can keep an accurate representation of the battlefield picture in your mind's eye, you'll never be a viable target. And if you can avoid becoming a vi viable target, you're never going to have to use your prowess on the stick to overcome a situation where you're disadvantaged. We want to avoid becoming a viable target at all costs and only employ these strategies that we're going to discuss later on if, for some reason, our situational awareness breaks down. So that begs the question, how do we do that? How do we maintain a constant, vigilant situational awareness so we can avoid being bounced to, to begin with? The first step is scanning habits. This is often overlooked. If you don't have a track IR that you're using in your favorite sim, it's going to be the most bang for your buck investment in your flight sim setup that you can do because it's going to allow you to maintain much better situational awareness. Scanning is everything. I scan behind me, above me, by each of my flanks, and I even quarter roll and sometimes even barrel roll to make sure that I am always scanning all sectors. It is a constant vigilance with scanning. When one pixel means the difference between life and death, we cannot let up with our scanning habits. Those are always going. So pretty basic, the first step in situational awareness is scanning. The next step I like to call wide sky awareness. And this is a subject that's brought up in a book called In Pursuit, written actually by a sim pilot who was very prevalent in the 90s and early 2000s. But wide sky awareness. If we can maintain the big energy picture, where are we? What kind of mission are we on? Are we defensive or are we offensive? If we're defensive, where is the enemy likely to come from? Okay, the line is to the west of me, for example. So I know that the enemy aircraft are most likely either going to come in from low altitude as bombers to bomb this point, and they're probably going to be accompanied by a high altitude combat air patrol. So I need to be maintaining a, a visual mindset of, okay, I need to be scanning if I do, if I do see a low bomber coming in to, do, to bomb my point, 
Maybe before I expend all my energy to go down and assail that bomber, I should scan and keep an eye out for the CAP aircraft that are probably going to be accompanying that bomber. Because I'm going to put myself in a disadvantage situation if I expend my energy, I'm low and slow maneuvering to try to kill a bomber, and his buddy is now bouncing me from behind. So wide sky awareness, we're talking about lines of retreat. If I do need to do an extension, which we'll discuss later, later if I do need to extend, what direction? Do I, do I do it east? Do I do it west? North? South? Do I, I definitely don't want to extend over enemy lines. That would make my situation worse. So we need to make a serious effort here to maintain our wide sky awareness, knowing what aircraft are going to be doing, what, what their likely mission is going to be, and where they're going to be relative to my position. And that kind of leads us into the next subject. The next aspect of situational awareness is psychology. Now this aspect of situational awareness is a little bit more intangible. It's going to be the ability to, for you to understand the likely actions of your enemy. If you come down from a high six bounce and assail your target, and let's say you miss, and you need to zoom back up to altitude, back up to your perch, what kind of aircraft were you assailing? What was his likely mission, and what is he likely to do now? Is he a fighter that's likely part of a wing that's going to be now radioing for his wingmates to come in, immediately come to that area and to assist him? Or is it a sole bomber that's likely to just uh, ignore you and to keep on trucking towards its target? These are important questions you've got to ask yourself because now this is a dynamic picture on the battlefield. This might change rapidly now that you've missed your target. So now we need to understand what is our enemy likely to do. So to maintain situational awareness, we've got to keep our scan up. We've got to keep a mindful idea of the big picture, the wide sky awareness. And we have to un understand our enemy's psychology. Another thing we can do that is often overlooked is to have a reasonable idea of all of the possible aircraft capabilities we're likely to encounter. We need to know which aircraft we can outrun, which aircraft we can outturn, which aircraft we can outclimb, and which aircraft we can outgun. Even that can become a factor in certain situations. For example, if I look on my rear six and, and I realize I'm being bounced from above and I'm, let's say I'm in a 109K4. If I look back and I realize I'm being dived on by a Spitfire, I know now that there's a re you know, depending on the altitude, depending on the parameters, which we'll discuss later, it might be a better decision for me to put the pedal to the metal and to extend straight out and to try to put some distance between me and him and create some separation rather than for me to do a brake turn or to begin maneuvering because he can outturn me. And if I know he can outturn me, that's going to affect my decision making. So aircraft capability is another huge factor of situational awareness. So if we can employ these various methods of maintaining situational awareness and we have good situational awareness, we should always enter a fight with advantages on our side. We should never knowingly enter a fight with a disadvantage. If we can maintain situational awareness and avoid becoming a viable target, that should never happen. We should also think of situational awareness as a consumable resource. A novice, inexperienced pilot can be easily task-saturated and lose all situational awareness in certain conditions. The second that they become offensive and they get into what they, they padlock onto a target, as it's called, they don't have any situational awareness for the most part. It's difficult for a novice pilot to continually check their six and also continue to fight. So what can we do to maintain situational awareness and to make it as easy as we can on ourselves? To do that, we're going to look back at Oswald Boca's Dick de Boca, which was his set of rules that he developed in World War I for those pilots to be more successful. We're going to just borrow the first one, which states that we should always try to secure advantages before attacking. If we can secure advantages before attacking, the attack becomes that much easier, and now we can maintain better situational awareness. To do that, we're going to always try to maintain a better altitude and speed than the enemy aircraft in the area. That gives us an advantage. Additionally, we're going to limit ourselves to a single pass for the most part. In most conditions, unless you have great situational awareness and you know that this, this enemy is completely alone, you're going to limit yourself to a single pass on the enemy. And finally, we're going to avoid surrounding ourselves with the enemy. Now, there's a lot of Call of Duty pilots out there that love to get into the center of a fur ball and really mix it up. And if that's what you want to do, that's fine. But don't be surprised if your performance compared to some of your peers is subpar as far as kill-death ratio, as far as survivability is concerned, because this is the absolute most nightmarish situation that you can get in in a guns-only situation. There is almost no pilot that can maintain adequate situational awareness in a furball. There's just too much changing too quickly. Now, does that mean that we can't attack at all if we see a furball? No. 
what we need to do is just to keep these things in mind. We need to maintain superior altitude and speed, and we need to make a single pass. A single slashing attack on a, s on a specified target in a furball, and then we need to resume our perch. If we, if we stop, if we lose energy, and start turning with those opponents in that furball, now we've, lo now we've surrounded ourselves with the enemy. So I'm not, just to, just to be clear, I'm not saying don't attack a furball. I'm saying you need to do it while being mindful of your situational awareness and how easily it can be overly tasked. So the number one thing we can do to increase our survivability on the battlefield is to maintain adequate situational awareness and to only engage on our own terms with advantages and never engage with knowingly at a disadvantage. Okay, that's the first thing we can do. But, as we all know, situational awareness is going to break down. Nobody has perfect situational awareness all the time. So, considering that inevitably we're going to be bounced by a target we didn't see, or we didn't see until the last possible moment, what do we do now? What strategies can we employ now that we're defensive, we're stuck with somebody with more energy, with higher speed, higher altitude coming in from behind us, what can we do now? 